The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello everyone, welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Hyman. Today, we'll update you what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we go front and center, talking about Project Renewal, as their scan van is providing clinical breast exams, mammograms, and health education to homeless and low-income men and women. And afterwards, we'll learn about a film festival that's highlighting and promoting the cinematic contributions worldwide of African directors, as well as filmmakers. Then a little later on, we'll talk about the new feature products Fresh Direct is releasing just in time for the fall. We'll give you some more details a little later on in the show. And then also we'll discuss about how a not-for-profit organization that's actually created to develop cinemas and audiences for independent films and music, which depict the global black experience. And then we'll speak with a motivational speaker and author on his story about friendship, forgiveness, redemption, adversity, as well as tough love. And then finally, we're gonna learn about some initiatives New Settlement is doing to address food insecurity right here in the borough of the Bronx. So stay with us, don't go anywhere. We've got a whole lot ahead. Open continues right now. to open. I am Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, October 27th. You're watching Open, a live and interactive program that brings the Bronx to New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on our MNN channel. We encourage you to find out more about Open and our other programs by visiting our website at bronxnet.org and, of course, our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Well, a lot has certainly been going on throughout the course of the past week. We can't take you through everything, but we can bring you a couple of things with our Bronx updates. We start off with news across the city. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is requesting restaurants to act immediately to dismantle unused dining structures across the city. Now, according to the mayor, the city is currently canvassing the 10,000 makeshift structures throughout the five boroughs to assess how many are actually being used to currently feed customers. Created as a part of the Open Restaurants program, the structures proved to be a lifeline for restaurants who couldn't maximize their indoor seating because of social distancing restrictions. Now, they're most often used to feed diners who prefer not to eat indoors and those customers who remain unvaccinated. Businesses found using their sheds for any other purposes may find their permission to operate their uh, structures revoked and they could be returned to parking space status. We want you to stay with us. We got more show open continues coming up right after this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. And hey, welcome back to the show. Project Renewal is a New York City not-for-profit organization that is working to end the cycle of homelessness by empowering individuals as well as families in renewing their lives with health, 
homes, as well as jobs. Now, the Project Renewal Scan Van offers free mammograms and clinical breast exams to women who are age 40 and older. Sharing details now is the director at Project Renewal Scan Van, Angela Brunswick. And uh, Angela, good to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, the uh, Project Renewal Scan Van has been around since like 2007. Um, it is a big part of Project Renewal's mission in, in terms of um, serving women um, who are underserved, who are uninsured or underinsured. And uh, we provide free mammogram screening and clinical breast exams, in addition to offering them uh, fit kits for um, colon cancer screening. Um, we not only provide the mammograms, but we also follow up with the patient after um, they, we get the results of their mammograms. They come um, onto the vans. We have a 40 foot uh, van that's split into three compartments. The first compartment the patient comes into and they're registered um, with our registrar. And then they go back into the second compartment, which is where the mammogram is actually done. Um, by the tech. And then there's a third compartment that they go into where they receive their clinical breast exam and they receive instructions on how to provide uh, breast exams, self breast exams at home. Once we get their results, we send them a letter uh, detailing their results. If we have women that have abnormal results, we provide patient navigation for them. And what we do is we have a nurse practitioner who will contact the patient with the results of their uh, report. Uh, they will speak to them about what the report says and um, what their next steps would be. She then forwards that information to our patient navigator who contacts the patient and actually walks the patient through uh, diagnostic um, appointments all the way through till the end of her diagnosis. Um, by providing these services, we're able to assist women in detecting an early detection of breast cancer. And I think, as you know, um, women of color, more so black women, are diagnosed at a higher rate than um, non-women of color. Right. Um, and I think the reason is, is because of the disparities, the health disparities in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, and we focus on communities that are underserved. Uh, we bring our services to those communities. We go to all of the boroughs and we provide services in Suffolk. Um, let, me jump, let, me, let, me, let me jump here and just ask a question because you, you, you talked about bringing services to people. And, and for our viewers, we do know that it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month and an opportunity to really highlight uh, what it is to it, the breast cancer is and making people more aware. But let me ask you, as you're bringing these services to people, what is the receptivity like? Are people more prone to say, since you're bringing the van to me, I'll take advantage of the services in an area where sometimes people typically won't go and get an exam? Well, I mean, they're usually aware because we, we collaborate with community-based organizations and churches and we do health fairs. So they're usually aware that we're coming. Um, when I work with the sponsors, I make them aware that the uh, women, the, the women should call us to make an appointment, especially during COVID, because we don't want too many women on the van at the same time, and we don't want to overbook so that we can't see everyone. Um, but most of the time, we have appointments. The appointments are there, and, and the, the women show up for the most part. The no-show rate is very low. I think women are starting to feel a lot more comfortable coming out now. Um, I think they're more comfortable coming into the van environment as opposed to going into a hospital-based um, radiology center for their mammograms. And talk to me a little bit more about this whole thing about eligibility, because uh, in order to be eligible for this, what's the eligibility requirement for somebody who may say, I want to do this? Okay, they need to be um, the ages of 40 and over. Um, they can be uninsured or insured, um, it doesn't matter. If they're uninsured, we partner with the um, cancer screening programs in all of the boroughs. And once they're diagnosed, if they are diagnosed, we partner with the DSPs um, and they provide the case management piece and we provide the patient man, um, navigation piece. And what they will do is ensure that um, if the patient is not insured and they 
treatment, they will get them qualified for um, Medicaid or whatever insurance they can get through them, or they will fund it themselves and get the woman through the process. And so as you're looking now and you're trying to spread the word about breast cancer awareness and having people take more advantage of the services that are actually available, we know that making it easier for somebody to have access is very important. Um, and the follow-up, uh, I want you to just share with uh, our viewers a little bit about the follow-up because as you said earlier, you know, once a person takes this test in the van, it's not over and done with, but you really have a way of being able to follow up with somebody. So for instance, for a person who may have results that aren't so favorable, um, how do you walk them and navigate them through the future stages of getting the necessary treatment? Um, as I said before, like the nurse practitioner will contact them and speak to them about their diagnosis. And then our patient navigator is really the key staff member that walks the staff, that walks the uh, patient through the process. She will call her um, after the nurse practitioner has explained uh, next steps and she will actually link them to a diagnostic facility, one of our partnering um, diagnostic facilities for them to get the follow-up care or treatment or diagnosis that they need. And then once that's done, um, well, actually they, they, they follow up throughout the process. So they may make the appointment for the woman and then later call back to make sure she attend, you know, that she made it to the appointment and if not, she'll contact the patient to see, you know, what's going on. Um, for those women who do file, uh, follow through with their diagnostic protocol, um, we usually obtain the reports, the final reports, so that we have them for our records and so that we know that the follow-up is complete and the patient has been treated. Yeah. And would you share a little bit with our viewers about the importance of early detection? Because that's what you're after, really being able to get the awareness so that way people can get early detection. Early detection is key. Um, we recommend that women start getting their mammograms at the age of 40 and get them on an annual basis, particularly if you have a history of um, cancer in your family. And not only breast cancer, just cancer on either side, on the mom's side or dad's side, um, or different types of cancer. It's, it's safe to be proactive and get that mammogram starting at the age of 40. Um, uh, mammograms are self-referred. You don't have to have a primary care physician to come onto our van to get a mammogram. Um, some radiology places do um, expect that, but we don't. And the reporting is available for you if you need it. You'll receive a letter saying what your results are. Um, and if you want to follow up and get your report, you can call us and give us the consent and we will forward the report to your attention. All right. And so we gotta leave it there, but thank you so much for this very vital information. And hopefully uh, women will take advantage of this uh, service as it continues to uh, go across the city uh, to really help in the area of area uh, of early detection as we are doing our part in spreading the word about Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Angela, thank you so much for being with us. Can I just say one more thing? If anyone is interested in contacting us, either to sponsor an event or to, or to make an appointment, they can reach us at 646-415-7932. And we have an email that is scanvan at projectrenewal.org. That's right. And I was going to let our viewers know again, if you want more information, don't forget to go to projectrenewal.org. And also you can see them on social media at Project Renewal. We're going to take a quick break. We've got more show. Don't go anywhere. Angela, thanks for joining us. Hope we continues coming up right after this. Okay.
back to the show. The African Diaspora International Film Festival is a minority-led organization that is presenting, interpreting, and educating about films. They're actually exploring the human experience of people of color all over the world in an effort to inspire as well as imaginations and as well as disrupting stereotypes that help to transform attitudes to perpetuate injustice. Now, by placing the spotlight on innovative films, which would otherwise be ignored by traditional venues, the festival offers a unique platform for conveying a diaspora, and I should say an African diaspora artistic styles, as well as crafts in film. And joining us now and sharing more details is the co-director and co-founder of the African Diaspora International Film Festival, Diaria and Dalspesh, as well as director of the Sleeping Negro Film, Skinner Myers, and founder of the Walk of the Spirit, Julia Brown. And thank you all for being here with us this morning on Open. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Diaria, I guess I'll start off with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about why. I mean, I gave a little bit of an intro why, but, but tell us about why you feel like this film festival is so important in bridging a gap. I think it's very important because we are the only ones presenting those type of films. Uh, really, we present films, like you said, that focus on the human experience of people all over the world. And it's really very global perspective. And so we bring films that people don't get a chance to see. Um, this year we have 78 films from 38 countries, including 38 films that were never screened in the US or in New York. And the festival is going to be both virtual and in person. Um, so we have a, a, a large number of films, for example, in the Bronx, I know you have a, a large percentage of, of Spanish speaking population. And so I want to highlight the fact that we have films from uh, Colombia, from Brazil, from Mexico and Panama that explore the Afro-Latino experience. And then of course we have a lot of African-American titles. One program I'd like to mention particularly is the school program. Uh, this is a program we have in the festival. This year it's going to be virtual that is offered free of charge for students from five to 12th grade. And we have two films this year. One is called Memoirs of the Black Girl. The other one, Souls of Black Girl. Both films focus on um, young black women. And the screening, one focuses on the issue of bullying in school and the other one on the issue of uh, self-esteem. And both screenings are going to be followed by a Zoom with a counselor who is going to uh, talk with the students about those issues and then offer um, sp spaces where they can continue the conversation after the festival. So this is the type of work that we do. We want to bring unique films, unique conversations, and give a platform to filmmakers who otherwise would not get a chance to showcase their work. Yeah. And I know, Skinner, you've got a film uh, called The Sleeping Negro. And uh, talk to us a little bit about your film and uh, why you feel, what you want people to be able to take away from that. Well, The Sleeping Negro uh, is a film about a young Black man who is having um, some issues with his worldview. A couple of things are happening at work, uh, something in his relationship, and it's causing him to reassess how he feels about his positionality as a black person in America. And so it's, it's part essay film, part chamber drama. Um, it's very interior. And I hope that the audience um, can take away what it feels like to be a black male, specifically in America. Um, the lack of agency, the lack of being able to control what happens around you in so many ways. Um, it's, it's a very blunt uh, film, it's very intense. It's also 73 minutes, um, so I don't torture you too long. Um, but I, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a very um, it's a very personal film, and hopefully people can, you know, it's not just recognize my hum humanity. It's it's really trying to empathize um, and find out ways that you know people can change to help the situation of the black community in America. Yeah. Julia, you've got a film called Walk in the Spirit. And for people who may not be so familiar, uh, a little bit about your film and the work that you've got going. The film is actually called um, Fighting for Respect. And it's about a, a, a very important turning point in African-American history, but that's not really well widely known. It is the, uh, the participation of the, and the um, effect of the world, African-American soldiers in World War I in France. So we're talking about a hundred years ago, about starting late 1917, early 1918, when 
you know, 200,000 African-American soldiers volunteered to go overseas. And they thought they were gonna fight for, you know, for democracy. That's what they wanted to show America, you know, Jim Crow America, that they were, that they were valuable, that they had the patriotism, that, that they were American through and through. But what happened when, most, when they got there was they were, most of them were assigned to a division called Services of Supply, which was basically a labor battalion. So they didn't get, didn't get anywhere near the, near the front line, but there were two divisions of them, the 92nd and the 93rd, who were lucky enough to be loaned to the French army because the French army had been at it for like already three, three and a half years and they just, they, they were depleted. So they, the African-American soldiers were lent to them. And these two divisions, the 92nd and 93rd, they were taught, trained, uh, extra training by the French, but they managed to bring lots of medals, lots of victories on the fields. You know, there were ups and downs, there were some failures, there were, there were a lot of challenges, but they distinguished themselves to the point that now, when you go out into the Northeast France on the world, where the World War I was, um, was fought with the battle and the battlefields, you see memorials soldiers you see them in the american cemeteries and in many of the cemeteries out there so their their contribution to that war and to the effort to bring a democracy to the world was is still recognized but the point is when they came back to the united states in the um in 1918 they thought okay then that meant that they were going they were going to be better treated at home not at all, not at all. Even it was even worse. There was the 1919 Red Summer in St. Louis, and I, if I could say this, all hell broke loose. They were some of them were lynched in their uniforms, so nothing wow. changed. So, but but they did both the soldiers and the the laborers. They did their letters that they wrote home to nurture the the um, civil rights movement upcoming. Yeah, Ziara. Before we go, I really want people to have an opportunity to find out how they could actually participate in this. It sounds very exciting to be able to see uh, history being told uh, through the interpretive lens of people of communities of color. Please tell people how they can be connected and what they can do to participate. Okay, so they can go to the website nyadiff.org nyadiff.org and they can choose to see films in person for example Skinner's films is the opening night film and will he will be in new york for the opening night on uh, november 28th so we invite everybody to participate in that they can go to the website nyadiff.org and they'll be able to uh, purchase a ticket there and also the um, fighting for respect is a virtual screening so anybody in the tri-state area can watch the film. And again, it's the same website, nyadiff.org. And the entire lineup is, is there. Uh, we break down by section, by themes. We have a lot of very interesting programs uh, to, to discover during the festival. So I really invite people to, to attend. Well, thank you all for joining us. We gotta leave it there, but certainly looking forward to having the opportunity for people to see these films and to be a part of this great film festival. I wanna thank Diara, I wanna thank Julia and definitely Skinner and uh, Skinner, safe travels on your way into New York. Thanks so thank much you. for being with us. Thank you thank for having you. us. Thank, thank you. you. All righty. Well, I'll let you know also if you want more information, don't hesitate. Go to that website again, nyadiff.org. And also, you can visit them on Twitter at nyadiff. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We've got more show open continues coming up right after this.
welcome back. Autumn in New York and at home just got better with Fresh Direct's launch of an exclusive frozen pizza line with Barstool Sports and a lineup of unique seasonal beers. Now, in addition, Fresh Direct has also added a wide variety of coffee options, including local Bronx brand Don Carvajal Cafe. And joining us now to share more details in the, is the divisional merchandiser that's actually specializing in grocery at Fresh Direct. We're pleased to have Charlotte Meyer. And uh, Charlotte, good to have you. Hi, hey, Darren. Great to, great to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you. And so, yes, as we are now in the fall season, I know the Fresh Direct is busy and uh, adding to its lineup. And uh, you've, I'll talk a little bit about this. First of all, the, the ability to add on uh, and then having this direct line with pizza with Barstool Sports. Yeah, absolutely. We were we were really excited when we um, had the opportunity to launch the Barstool Sports pizza line. Uh, we're one of the first retailers to launch it. And we just think it's kind of the perfect extension to our meal solution offering that we carry and a great um, opportunity for all of our customers to have a fun pizza party at home for football season this fall. Yeah, the fall is here. Certainly football season is here. Don't forget basketball. I'm a basketball guy. We just got started so we can watch that. We can watch yeah, basketball yeah. too. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I know that really uh, part of your mission is really uh, to partner with local businesses, to bring uh, fresh produce and fresh products at home. Talk to us because I know right here in the borough of the Bronx, you're also working uh, with a very special company. We are. So we are working with Don Carvajal Cafe, which is a, a coffee roaster based here in the South Bronx. Um, they are, uh, they develop partnerships with coffee co-ops in Central and South America, and they're really focused on bringing um, fair trade, um, eco-certified, sustainable coffee options to, um, to the market. So we love working with them. We launched with them in June of this year and um, just really excited to see their growth on, on our platform and excited to see their growth just overall. I think they're selling like crazy at farmers markets all over New York City, and um, I think they'll be you know, expanding even more very soon. Yeah. And in addition to that, we talk about coffee, but not just coffee. We talk about coffee. We talk about pizza, but I forgot to mention a little bit about craft beers. Craft beers are also uh, in your, in your mix. Uh, so share with us a little bit about the craft beer extension. Yeah. So really excited to be offering some seasonal beers again this year. Fall beer is kind of one of the things that customers get most excited about. And of course it pairs perfectly with pizza. Um, so we've got a bunch of really exciting pumpkin beers and kind of fall beer flavors. And they're really the perfect thing to pair with, with your pizza or with whatever you're cooking for dinner that night. And um, just really excited to be able to offer that kind of full meal offering in just one click to fresh dry customers. Yeah. What's it like for you now? Because given the fact that we're all still trying to navigate through COVID, but in many ways, uh, it seems as though we've gotten through the worst. But uh, what's it been like for you in terms of working with businesses and partnerships, uh, given the fact of this huge COVID impact? Yeah, I mean, we, we've always felt it's so important to work with local businesses and to really uh, amplify local businesses within the within our market. But um, I think, you know, we're, we're just continuing to grow and continuing to, to partner with local businesses to get their products out there and get customers excited about them. Yeah. And so talk to us a little bit about what's ahead. I mean, I know you got a lot on your plate right now, but uh, can you give us a little glimpse into the future of some of the things you might be working on? We're always looking for new great product. So just continuing to think about how can we make it easier for our customers to get a great meal on the table quickly and easily. And, um, you know, just trying to make it as easy and fun at mealtime and to take away any of the stress that people might be feeling about what to feed themselves and their families. So continuing to source amazing product and, and really excited to keep doing so. Are you seeing a little business boost given the fact that so many people are actually staying at home or working from home now uh, than, than ever before? We are definitely, yeah. Um, we, yeah, we've seen some really exciting growth over the last year and a half and, and continue to see that growth. So yeah, we yeah, are. Well, I'm excited for you and uh, wanna thank you for coming and sharing with us a little bit about what you got going on and certainly some exciting things happening at Fresh Direct during uh, this fall season. And so Charlotte, thank you for being with us and letting us know what's going on. Thanks, Aaron. thanks so much for having me.
Oh, love it, love it, love it. Well, let's just let one of our viewers know too. Again, if any of that, you know, teased your palate, you can get more information at freshdirect.com. And always don't forget uh, to visit them on their social media platforms at Fresh Direct. Uh, we do have more show. We want you to stay with us. So don't go anywhere. Open is coming up right after this. If you're struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit, or call toll free at 833-511-0311. That's 833-511-0311. Five one one zero three one one. to the show, Image Nation Cinema Foundation is a Harlem-based media arts group that's founded with the goal of establishing a chain of art house cinemas dedicated to progressive media by and about people of color. Their goal is to empower Black communities by presenting a variety of public programs, fostering media equity, as well as media literacy, solidarity, and cross-cultural exchange, as well as highlighting the humanity of Pan-African people worldwide. Join us now and sharing more details as the founder and executive director of Image Nation, Moy Moikansi Kama. And uh, Moikansi, good to have you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, glad to have you. And I know that uh, this comes at a good time. Uh, actually, you're just actually coming off the heels of a very special event and uh, sh uh, showcasing the films and the arts. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, uh, we just wrapped up our um, 19th annual Image Nation Outdoors Festival. Um, it's a summer long showcase of independent films uh, in parks and outdoor venues throughout uh, Harlem. And we um, highlight the global black experience. So we had everything from uh, In the Heights, uh, we showed In the Heights, we showed a horror film uh, by Tanya Pinkins. We actually did the premiere of that in the park at uh, St. Nicholas Park. Um, we had a film on African art in, in Kinshasa. We had all aspects of, of global black culture expressed through the festival. Um, unfortunately, the rain had us uh, continue until October. <laughs> and we had our, our last screening was a film called The Neutral Ground about the, uh, the movement to remove monuments, the Confederate monument, monuments in the South. So uh, our festival is pretty diverse and we try to show films that speak to the variety of uh things that we as a people experience worldwide and when we talk about communities of color they're not oftentimes depicted in the film and the arts because mainstream uh you know mainstream cinema se seems to gear itself towards a particular way and it's almost as though we have to do our own advertising branding and bringing a social consciousness talk to us about that level of consciousness that you're trying to uh, uh learn more about film as well as filmmakers? Well, I think that, um, you know, I've been doing this work for 20 years. <laughs> and so um, it's changed a bit over the years. I think there are more opportunities for filmmakers of color right now, but uh, it's still difficult for independent filmmakers to kind of break through all of the noise in the media and be and be recognized. And so uh, our festival is an opportunity for filmmakers who have something different to say to reach audiences that that are, that are willing to listen um you know oftentimes the movies that you see the same movie over and over again you see the movie about you know about something happening in an urban environment and there's a gun and there's drugs you know that that's the story right. you see all the time you see a particular story about the latin community you see you know specific um poverty images about africa you know and this is not these don't represent the totality of who we are so when programming films we try to bring uh films that show different aspects of who we are that highlight our humanity and that give us the opportunity to support independent filmmakers who are making works that validate us. Yeah. And you got another event coming up around the corner too. And uh, for D'Angelo lovers, uh, why don't you share with us a little bit about that? 
Well, we have a partnership with the Apollo Theater. Uh, the series is called Image Nations Cocktails and Soul Cinema. And uh, the, the series actually started in uh, 2019, before the pandemic. Uh, we were able to do two live shows before COVID hit. <laughs> and so um, the rest of the series has been uh, on the Apollo's digital stage. Um, but it's been it's been going really well. We've been able to continue to bring amazing films. And uh, the next iteration is November 4th. It's a, a virtual showing of the film D'Angelo, I'm sorry, Devil's Pie D'Angelo, which is a documentary that explores uh, his comeback back in 2014 when he had disappeared for quite a while. And um, it's a kind of a rare film. I mean, the film premiered at Tribeca in 2019, and then it hasn't been really screened uh, or released officially in the United States since. It had a release in the Netherlands. But other than that, you know, there have been a few sporadic screenings. So it's a rare opportunity to see a rare film about an artist who's pretty scarce, who doesn't really make himself available to the public, but I think who a lot of us love. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I encourage folks to check it out. Um, it's a, the, the director was embedded in his tour. And so you see a lot of behind the scenes, you see a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with D'Angelo. Dave Chappelle is in the film, Quest Love is in the film. And uh, I also have a Q and A with the director afterwards. So um, it's a, a, a wonderful experience. Uh, we're gonna have, if you buy a ticket, you get the uh, cocktail recipe sent to you. So you can have, you don't have to, you know, pretend to have a cocktail. You can have your cocktail at home. You can make it virgin or you can spike it. <laughs> it's, called, <laughs> it's a brown sugar sure. cocktail. Uh, we try to keep the experience intact. So this, the program is called Cocktails and Soul Cinema. So, you know, we send you the recipe so you can feel like getting the whole experience online. Yeah. And you know, as you mentioned before, you know, you've been in this work for more than 20 years doing it. And so uh, what is the takeaway that you want for people who take part in your work and your festivals and the things that you do? Um, I, I think the takeaway is that there are alternative ways to consume media that um, if you're interested in supporting um, black artists and black entrepreneurs, we're one of those opportunities. Um, we provide wonderful programs and we really are um, work have always worked to create a platform where artists of color, artists who have uh, progressive representations of communities of color can intersect directly with the community. And I think, you know, it's one thing to be on a Netflix, um, but it is another thing to support black owned media. And that's who we are. Yeah. And so for people who want to get connected and really, uh, you know, find out more about what you got going on, how do they do that? Uh, you can, you can check out our website. It's imagenation.us. You can hit us on Facebook. It's Image Nation Foundation. Um, those are the best ways to contact us. Yeah. Or you can email me, which is mpk at imagenation.us. And before we go, give our viewers an opportunity to know a little bit more about what they may be seeing coming around the corner. Well, oh, we, we, um, we also will come back with our outdoor series this summer. We're working on some digital initiatives that we're not ready to announce yet, but stay tuned. And mm -hmm. we actually recently launched a series in Indianapolis, which I'm really excited about. Um, I don't think we go that far with this broadcast, but I just want to brag about it. <laughs> yeah. No, listen, we're virtual, so we're virtual, so you get it. You, it, it hits. So yeah. Okay. So, but awesome. but definitely. Yeah, so, so thank you. Oh, so the uh -huh. cocktails and soul Center designed to be a national series because of COVID it took us a while to get into other markets but we're now uh going to be in Indianapolis we're showing the documentary Nation Time uh which is about the 1972 National Black Political Convention that took place in Indianapolis so they're pretty excited to have that film and so we'll, we'll have more programs like that coming you can check our website imagenation.us to see what else we have coming up uh, well, thank you again, Moikansi, for being with us and uh, best wishes. I know you got the uh, Apollo event coming up and certainly hopefully yeah. we'll get a few of our viewers to come on out and take part and uh, get that cocktail recipe too. That's thank right. you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All righty. Moikansi Kama, our guest here, and we want to let you know if you want more information, don't hesitate. Visit their website, imagenation.us, and then also follow them on Instagram at imagenation.us. U.S. We got more show. Don't go anywhere. Open continues coming up right after this. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. 
and coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on BronxNet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at BronxNet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs> And welcome back to the show. Our next guest recently wrote a book about his life journey, discussing his courage to continue, the boldness to defy the odds. His book, My Feet Are Off the Ground, is a story about friendship, forgiveness, redemption, adversity, as well as tough love. Join me now and sharing more details is motivational speaker and author, Jeff Williams. And uh, Jeff, good to have you back here on the show. Good morning, Darren. It's a pleasure to be back on the show. And um Thank you for having me and letting me discuss my book that I've been working on since the last time we've met. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come on the show is just to bring more exposure to the book because I feel like it's something that's very important for a lot of people to read because the book is motivational, inspirational, and it's about forgiveness. And I think this book speaks about forgiveness in a way most people have never forgiven before. And um, one of the other things that touched me with the book is from the people who have read it already, you know, it just showed them that no matter what you go through, no matter what challenges you're faced in life, you can overcome them and still progress and be successful. Yeah. And I want to get an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the book and your life, because, you know, you're very passionate about letting people know about your life story without giving away all the contents of the book, but give some people a little bit of background as to uh, your life and where you are today. Well, when I was 13 years old, I was accidentally shot by one of my friends playing with a gun. And where most people at 13 are going through puberty and on their way to high school, I was faced with a life changing event. And it kind of put my future on hold because after being shot and paralyzed, I didn't realize what my future would look like. I had no idea where I would go from that point. And it left me in a dark place where I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel at the moment. And for you, obviously, it's been, you know, that experience itself is traumatic. That experience was life-changing for you. And you talk about walking around in a dark place, and then you had that turnaround moment. Uh, share with us, what, what was the turnaround moment for you uh, where you were able to engage in forgiveness and really uh, being able to now be a voice for those who've actually had similar experiences and, and life's traumas? I think the turnaround point was when I was in the hospital and I was coming out of recovery from one of, my oper from one of the several operations that I was having to remove the bullet. And I'm laying on a stretcher and I have this young guy sitting next to me on a stretcher and he looks at me and tears are running out my eyes. And he says to me, you know, why are you crying? And I looked at him and I said, I'm paralyzed, I can't move my legs. And he asked me, could I see my legs? And when he asked me that at the moment, I thought the question really didn't make a lot of sense and he removed the sheet from his legs. And I realized he didn't have any legs. Um, he was in a train accident, a Metro North train ran his legs over. He was playing on the train tracks. And to see him with a smile on his face and not have his legs, it just made me realize that no matter how bad I think I am, there's always somebody who has it worse. And watching him and several other the kids that was on the hospital ward who had spina bifida, who had um, been paralyzed from their neck down with injuries that appeared to be worse than what my injuries were, it just showed me that, you know, so many other people are going through so many different things. We all have a story. We all have life challenges. So... I didn't want to be selfish at that moment and only worry about or think about myself. So it kind of changed the focus of my life at that moment. And so now you go on to write the book and obviously your book is a, a, a life in the making, if you will. Share with us how long it took you to really decide to put it from pen to paper and to get it out there. Was it a long process? It actually, when we went into that 
um, quarantine for the pandemic, I, I'm, I'm real active. So I'm not used to being in the house a lot. So I was sitting in the house and I'm wondering what am I gonna do with all this time? You know, I'm working from home, I'm home every day. We can't really go outside. You know, we have to be safe due to the pandemic. And I'm thinking to myself, how can I be productive with this time? And for years, I wanted to write this book and tell the story because I would go speak to different individuals who were recently injured. And usually when a parent called me to ask me to come and speak to their kid who was either from a gunshot wound, a car accident, things like that, that they ended up paralyzed and they felt like I could be that voice to change this person's life. And I remember going to visit a young man by the name of Edward. And when I went in the room to speak to him, the impact that I had on him and the fact that he, I was able to connect with him through this accident that we both shared and give him a reason to live. When I left the hospital that day, it just made me feel like this story is more powerful than I actually know. It's actually something that is building people, changing their lives making them reevaluate their situation and look at their future and not at what happened to them. Yeah. And so as you wrote this book now, you have got it out and going. Talk to us about the process. Uh, you're out there right now. The book is out there. Uh, you've got a book tour coming? Yes. One of, one of the other things doing, like writing this book and putting it together, uh, I had the honor of meeting my editor, Nilsa Crosby, and she had a writing course called Helping Writers Write. So I took the course and during the course, I learned better ways and better strategies to write a book. And one of the things that stuck to me the most was I felt like she showed me how to bring details to life. And in the sense of, you know, when you look down the street or you're mentioning uh, a scene, it kind of taught me how to bring my reader into the book with the details so they could actually feel and walk through the story as if they were me. And I was able to nail that. And I think that's what makes this book so special because it takes you through the journey of that dark place that I was in. And it brings you to the light of when I transitioned into the success story. Yeah, I can't leave without talking about Jay Lorenzo motivational speak, uh, sneakers. Uh, so you got some motivational sneakers out there, huh? Yes, I also um, created a pair of sneakers and each one of the sneakers have like a motivational quote in them. And I put the motivational quote in the sneakers so when people wear my sneakers and they put them on in the morning, they actually read this quote and start their day in a, mo in a positive way because I feel like your life is basically the way you think. So if you think positive, then it kind of leads you into a positive day and makes you feel good inside. When you feel good inside, you feel good outside. Well, I got to congratulate you again, brother. It's been great having you uh, be with us. You know, you're, you're an inspiration to so many people. And I uh, want to thank you so much for taking the time. And congratulations on the book and the sneaker line. And uh, hopefully we'll be getting a chance to chat real soon. Thank you so much, Darren, for having me today. Jeff Williams, our guest back here on Open, want to let you know, listen, if you want more information, I want you to go visit him. Uh, you can catch him on Instagram. He's got shoes by Jay Lorenzo. You can find out about the book. You can find out about the sneaker line, and you can get connected. Jeff, again, great to have you. And, of course, we're taking a quick break. Got more show. Open continues coming up right after this.
and welcome back to the show. Food is a complex issue with other societal conditions, such as employment, health, environmental, resilience, education, and housing. And with many Bronx families choosing between their next meal and having to pay their rent, New Settlements Community Food Action's vision is an alternative food system by and for communities, nourishing people, and supporting community development, climate protection efforts, as well as quality of life. And sharing more details about it is the Director of Community Health at New Settlement, Gus Stavrakis. And uh, Gus, good to have you. Good to be here. Yeah, and you know, food insecurity is huge, and uh, I want to thank you for the work that you're actually doing. And uh, for some people who aren't so familiar with your organization, why don't you just uh, bring us up to speed? So yeah, so uh, I'm part of New Settlement uh, Community Center, and kind of some of the things that we do is we developed as a tenants' right organization and grew from there. And specifically where I work in with community food initiatives and community health initiatives is what we kind of plan on doing is address uh, health needs within the community and as far as uh, food issues within our uh, Mount Eden and our neighboring communities and addressing the issues that come along with those. Yeah, show us a little bit about what you're seeing in your area because we know that food insecurity is huge and definitely has been more highly exacerbated because of COVID-19. What are you seeing from your perspective? So uh, I, so from my perspective, I definitely do see a lot of people and the need for having access to fresh produce and within the community of, of lacking resources to, uh, to buy produce as well too. So what we try to do is twofold and when it comes to food insecurity, is one is address kind of uh, the access to food and help uh, distribute free resources for uh, for food, either it be with our health and wellness pop-ups where we pr uh, provide fresh and healthy produce uh, brought by Grow NYC. And then with our farm stand, what we try to do with our farm stand is provide another alternative options to the supermarkets and the bodegas at where individuals that are SNAP and EBT recipients can use their benefits at the farm stand so they can buy fresh produce. And what we do is we partner up with the Department of Health and Department of Agriculture to also help subsidize the expense of those produce by using either health bucks or uh, farmer's markets uh, checks as well too, to help kind of uh, lower the cost of, of fresh produce. Yeah. And from what I understand, you also have a youth-led farm stand. So talk about the impact that you're having, uh, not just with adults, but really reaching the youth population. So yeah, so kind of the approach that we, we use and we look to is kind of um, meet, where, meet where people where they're at. And one of those is the youth and younger individuals and kind of develop them into future leaders. And so we use that with our farm stand as far as bringing them in either with uh, with different programs that we're associated with and bringing them in and having them kind of run and manage the farm stand, either it be kind of uh, taking like uh, processing payments and uh, setting up the farm stand, taking down the farm stand and dealing with customers. Because these are a lot of skills that, that is gonna be uh, need to be developed in later on in life. So having a safe place and a place where you can mentor and, and encourage young youth to build those, uh, those skills is an important place and something that we believe that we want to develop. Yeah. And so as the farm stand is out there, there's good food that's available. What are some of the things that, uh, or I should say, some of the fall foods that people can really take part in? So, yeah. So potatoes is a big one right now. Uh, and right now, a lot of our winter squashes are coming in. So if people like squash, they can come by and buy some squash. Uh, collie greens right now, uh, brazen greens, collie greens is, is a big thing that we're trying to sell. And yeah, so like our farm stand definitely highlights seasonal produce and seasonal food. So during the summer months, if you want to come, uh, if people come during the summer months, I know it's past, but we'll have like a lot of uh, like grapes, strawberries, peaches, pears, things like that. And then it's definitely kind of like our model is seasonal and local. So if we can grow it within this tri-state area, we're going to be able to sell it within the tri-state, uh, within, um, within our farm stand. And so right now, some of the, like I was mentioning earlier, some of the, the, the produce that we're selling right now is apples is a big one. <laughs> so you can, if you want some nice fresh apples from upstate, we can, we'll provide those. 
and onions, potatoes, garlic, and yeah, like like I said, collard greens is a big one too. Yeah, and when we talk about the fact that these foods are available, uh, the public really coming on and taking part in it, how much are you seeing more of the public actually come out and really take part in this? Because uh, we know a lot of people stay at home, but a lot of people are really looking out for uh, and desiring to have fresh produce and fresh food. Yeah, so from what we found is kind of during the fall seasons and stuff, we have a lot of individuals coming by and wanting it. And this is a safer alternative, especially when it comes to if you're not comfortable going into a supermarket because of the closed space. We're in an open environment where there's a lot of uh, air exchange, so it's going to be safer to kind of uh, buy produce in this open air environment. So we've actually seen a lot of individuals with last year and then this year kind of being an alternative to buy fresh produce from the supermarkets because um, within the Bronx in this area, a lot of the supermarkets are smaller and more compact. And so now that they have a place to go shop that's uh, uh, open and more space, it, people f seem more comfortable. Yeah. So if, you have a, uh, if I have a parent that's out there watching right now and they say, listen, you know, I heard about the youth-led farm stand. How can they become engaged if a parent has some youth that may want to be uh, connected to the group, to your organization, I should say? So, yeah. So uh, a few of the things that we've kind of partnered up with summer, with summer youth and we've hired individuals from the summer youth program. And so you could always come to a new settlement community center and reach out to me directly if your children are interested in, in kind of developing these skills and kind of work. It is a seasonal job. So, and then kind of, we are kind of wrapping our season to uh, in November. So if child, if parents want to get their children involved, usually around uh, July and August, kind of reaching out to us is a perfect time to get involved. We also have a pantry as well too within the community center that we highlight. And if we we're always looking for volunteers to help staff it as well too to help distribute food to the to the public as well too. So yeah, just coming by New Settlement and, and asking for me, and we'll definitely be able to help them facilitate. Well, certainly I wanna thank you for coming and sharing with us here on the show. It's been great having you and uh, continue the great work that you're doing over there at New Settlement. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, Gus, we wanna thank you. Now listen, if you want more information, don't hesitate to visit the website at newsettlement.org. Again, newsettlement.org. Well, we've come to the end of our show today. We want to thank all of our guests for joining us. And most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch Recablecast on Broxess Channel 67. Of course, you can always find us on Verizon Files Channel 2133 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Now, if you want a brand new episode of Open, we encourage you to check out my girl, Rena Valentine. On Friday, and she'll bring you the best in arts and entertainment. A special shout out to all of those who are watching on MNN as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network channel. For all of us here at Open, I am Darren Jaime saying take care, God. So I'll keep this channel wide open.